Time to speak to our experts. Dr. Newman Arthur is a clinical psychologist and Dr. Betha Sewa Ayi is an infectious disease specialist. And since we started COVID-19 360, they've been on with us to educate the public further on how they can protect themselves and also giving us enough information about the disease as well. So today they are back again and we're going to keep talking about self-isolation. What is the right way to go about it? And looking at the situation where our frontline police officers have been asked to self-quarantine whilst some tests are being conducted to ensure that none of them have caught the virus. We're asking, is it feasible looking at the living conditions of majority of these police officers? And so doctors, thank you again and good morning for joining us. Uh, good, good morning. morning. Thanks for joining good us. Good morning. <laughs> Let me come to you first, uh, Dr. Newman. Um, I do understand, of course, that as a health worker, you may have spoken to a few people about self-isolation and looking at the conditions in Ghana, First of all, do you even think that it is even possible for majority of Ghanaians to self-isolate if they should come into contact with the virus or if they should test positive? Uh, I, think, I think generally, uh, depending on your living situation, it may be difficult or not. Let me give you like three scenarios. One, there was a woman who has about three kids, lives with about five others uh, in a two-bedroom apartment you know, and mm. with a, a husband and a, a, I think a nephew or something, right? And, and so they, they live in that, that small space. Mm. So self-isolating, you know, in that small space was really, really difficult, you know, and yeah, she has little kids who she takes care of and she's the, she's the one who cooks in the house. So she was even struggling to know how to cook. What do I do about these, you know, these kids they will mm. be there and they will come and they want to hug her and touch her. And she doesn't have a single uh, one room she could go and self-isolate and people coming around and all that. It was difficult. Yeah. And actually, she couldn't self-isolate. She couldn't. Mm. So she was trusting that, you know, the lab results will, will come up and, and it will be negative. You know, so that, that, that is one situation. And there are a lot of people in that kind of situation. You hardly find, you know, even those middle income, high in income you know, level people may not even have that number of space to mm -hmm. be able to say that I'm going to self-isolate. Then also, there was another person too who uh, lives with their mother. You mm -hmm. know, he's, he's a young man, lives with um, uh, his mother and father. You know, and it's, I think it's about two bedroom house or so, right? And yeah. before they had him to go uh, under some quarantine, he had interacted with this, them for a while, you mm. know. So the fact that, okay, I've been with them already. So if, even if I have it, they would have gotten it anyway. So why self-isolate? You know, that kind of mindset. So yeah. you have people living in that kind of condition where they are even the ones taking care of their parents on a day-to-day -day basis. For example, someone lives with a parent who is unwell right in terms of mobility and all that mm -hmm. and that person is the one who is supposed to take care of that pa parent on a day-to-day -day basis you know and and because of the lockdown rules and all that people can't come from far away maybe from the village or something to come and live with them to take care of that that woman so it's difficult then yeah. also you may have some people who live alone mm -hmm. so those who live alone it may be easy and even for those who live alone they may have to make arrangements for food and all that. Yeah. If they can't stock for a week or two, then that also becomes difficult, mm -hmm. right? But in the midst of that, you know, the psychological effect of this is huge. Mm. They may not have physical symptoms, but psychologically is there, especially trying to wait for your results, whether it will be negative or positive. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's, it's something else. So physically, they may not have any symptoms of a uh, cough, you know, fever and all that, you may say, okay, go. But that saying go in itself is not enough. Yeah. Medically, in terms of physical health, they may be fine. You know, no symptoms. And most of them, their problem is not even the symptoms of COVID-19. Mm -hmm. But the fact that all the stigma and all yeah. the, you know, issues around the fear, anxiety, stress in going about your normal duty. And I told you, I've gone on isolation before, mm -hmm. right? And the fact that, you know, I was walked straight from work into isolation yeah. straight you know with 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 my that dress i wore to work <laughs> you know uh, you go straight 
and they have to bring you food and put it at the door, you know, and they'll, they'll knock and they, so the person will run away, you know, as though <laughs> you, know, you, come and you have to come and pick the food. You know, it was some way. It can hey, be Dr. difficult. <laughs> oh, it can be difficult. But then, uh, Dr. Bertha, so if that's the case, then what's the best way to isolate? That's if you even have the means. I think that um, because... You know, right now we are in a mode of enhanced testing and aggressive um, pursuit of every single case. I'm almost thinking, you know, what is coming to mind is how we treated the 1,030 travelers who came in in the third week of March. Mm -hmm. They were put in a hotel and tested, and out of that, 105 or something were posted. I'm, I'm almost thinking that we should find a facility, whether it's a secondary school or a hotel, and any, if we get any sense of the fact that somebody cannot isolate well and will pass it on to even one person, we should spend some of the funds. We've collected $1 billion loan. Of course, I don't know what the money is being used yeah. for, but at least whatever funds we said we want to use to control this and keep them in a the place. Because if even one person transmits to one person, it's not just transmission to one person. You've potentially transmitted it to 81 or 243 people because that person one will give to three become nine 27 81 two so my, my i suppose what i'm saying is even one transmission can make a huge difference so if that's where we have to put resources it's costly but that is the situation as it is that's i the think thing. that it could be costly because looking at the mandatory quarantine of travelers, uh, we still don't have the figure as to how much governments may have spent uh, in keeping these people for two weeks, maybe three weeks, you know. And so if we're looking at incurring cost again, putting these number of people, and in this case, we're even talking about 8,000 or more police officers and a few other Ghanaians who may be asked to self-isolate who may not have the means as well. This means feeding them morning, afternoon, evening, uh, electricity, water, government is bearing that cost. But at the same time, you know, they are still going to feel the pinch. Right. But Bella, if you think about the fact that each person's life is worth over a billion dollars, okay? I mean, you cannot even quantify life. Take the example of the rector of our Ghana College of Physicians and Surgeons. Mm -hmm. I know, I don't know the identity of all those who have died, but the dagger and the pain that went through our hearts knowing what he means to the medical community and the fact that this is an irreversible loss. Whatever amount of money we will spend to save one life, I think it's, 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 it's incomparable to anything. Mm. So whatever we can do to prevent one transmission, I mean, when it's somebody's family, you can afford to say, oh, only nine dead or only ten. But when you crunch down to the details of who is involved? Mm -hmm. like, like in somebody I was talking to, we're talking about Egypt. When, when it, they said they should let my people go, that the Pharaoh was hard hearted until his firstborn son died. Immediately it hit close. He said, Go, just leave Egypt, go. Mm -hmm. So every life is important to somebody. And even if it's not important to anybody, you cannot put a value or a quantity on a human life. Mm. So, I mean, I think we can count the cost all we want. But if somebody dies, you can cry for a thousand days. You cannot bring them back. Yeah. So we should put emphasis on preventing death, preventing harm, and money. You can always... Job lost all his money, but he gained it back. Yeah. So there's a time to lose money, and there's a time to gain money. That's how I will put it. Okay, so let's say I live in a house with someone who has caught the virus. This person is supposed to self-isolate. What are some steps I should take to ensure that as much as I'm trying to care for this person, I'm also not infecting myself? Then I think you come close to the hospital with all the <laughs> COVID patients I have to see. I put on a mask, goggles, I check, is my nose mask okay? I'm gowning. Yesterday, I put on an overall with socks. I was looking weird in the hospital. Mm. I'm like, you know what? I am not taking any chances. So I think if, <laughs> if you're at home with such a person and you can afford it, go and get a hazmat suit mm. before you interact with the person. But anyway, to put it on a more serious note, you just have to make sure, like Dr. Newman is saying, keep a good three to six feet distance. Just slide the food next to them, let them pick it up, communicate with them, and, and make sure 
you are not inhaling the immediate, at least now we know that the virus can stay in a room for up to eight hours suspended in the air. So as much as possible, if you can even put some cloth in front of the door to seal off the air from permeating through the rest of the house. Wow. Let them stay there, encourage them every now and then, and, and um, keep, what, what, keep what, yourself. What if we share a bathroom? Well, what if it's a two-bedroom hmm. house, but we have to share a bathroom and a toilet and the kitchen? Okay, well, the person doesn't have oh, to come to the I, kitchen, but bathroom and toilet. Well, I, those are some of the things that I feel we should communicate with the health authorities. Because why spend money on expensive things when you can do something to stop the simple... At this point, we want to stop transmission of every single case. Mm -hmm. So if by communicating that, look, this is my house, this is what it is, I'm sharing this... Anyway, that's even another statement. In Ghana, almost everybody shares a bathroom with somebody. So I suppose it will require a lot of, when you finish using the bathroom, make sure you use Clorox or what, Dettol or whatever to clean the bathroom well mm. and open the windows to allow some air to go through before the next person comes to use it. Because, I mean, frankly, um, the risk is real. And if, if, as, if as a nation, we have to think through it and make sure that anybody who is infected is going to a person particular facility. That's why I'm excited about the infectious disease hospitals that um, yeah. Dr. Nsian Saris we are building. Okay. That, that will be the value of these things. Well, you did mention that the virus can stay in the atmosphere for about eight hours, suspended. So that means that if... Is that what you said? That's what you said, right? That, that was in, in a very... It was a controlled setting, meaning they purposefully aerosolized the, You know, they did a procedure that would yeah. create a lot of water droplets mm. it's not your usual talking but they they artificially created the environment and when they tested eight hours later it was still in the air in that room it doesn't mean it's airborne or it traveled very fast okay. okay but i'm saying that some of these um studies will give you some idea of what to do we are still learning about the virus but as you learn new knowledge you put it in your pocket and then try and change your behavior to suit you know, to suit the, 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 the learning. Because even in our care of COVID patients, after seeing a few of them, if you are not sick, you can start getting unnecessarily bold and getting close to their room. And then you have to remind yourself that, look, this patient has a virus I don't want to get. Okay, you know, so, so, um, so, so quick one. Does it mean that quickly, if I use the bathroom or if someone uses the bathroom and they're infected, I have to wait a number of hours. Is that something I can spray that can get rid of the virus? I mean, if we can use sanitizer on our hands, can we spray alcohol in the room? Would it, you know, kill the virus? I, I don't that? think alcohol in the air would make a difference, but definitely wiping the toilet seats um, and the sink will reduce the contact. At least. Or preferably, if you have more than one bathroom in the house, you can decide that that particular bathroom is going to be for that person. He should use it till the infection is over, while everybody else uses um, What I'm asking is, you know the droplets that stay in the air? So let's just say that the person just finished bathing and I walk in. There's a likelihood that I could, um, you know, catch it as well. Now, should I start going to my bathroom with my nose mask? Um, you can. I think that would be a good idea, but I don't know of any chemical that would destroy the droplets in the air. Wow. But it would be a good idea. Dr. Newman. I mean, even everybody <laughs> wearing a mask in that house will not be a stretch. Okay. Dr. Newman, you are nodding as well. Tell me why. <laughs> no, no. I, I, I was thinking that to, to re reduce the, the risk of inhaling those agents. I think that the uh, face marks will be, will be fine, especially the ones, the N95s and, and, and stuff. Even when the I'm bathing. may not be. Uh, it's, you, are, you are taking care of someone who has COVID-19, so you may have to be uncomfortable a bit. Okay. I, I don't think it's... It, it's it. Now, now, okay, you are scaring much. me because... Because for that, you know, I think that, that, that would help. Okay, so some of us stay in the studio in enclosed areas for a number of hours, constantly talking, interacting... We're here with the sound men, the technical crew, camera. So does it mean we're also at a higher risk if we're all in yeah, an enclosed uh, area? And what yeah, do we do? Because so, so everybody... Every, exactly. Um, but then if I'm coming on air and I'm speaking, I, I can't now. constantly wear a nose mask because, you know, my speech may not be audible. So how, what do I do?
I will, around this time, I think all of us have to be uncomfortable with 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 a, with a face mask because it's 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 going to help. It's, it's going to help. <laughs> I see. Anyway, let's talk about social. Okay, Dr. Betha, you wanted to speak on that? Well, I was going to say that, I mean, three, three TV, uh, not anchors, but media people at CNN, um, Chris Cuomo, I forget her first name, something Baldwin, mm. and um, another gentleman, um, a British-accented CNN, I've forgotten his name, but they've all tested positive and have been ill. So you wonder, is it the constant interaction? I'm not saying you have a high-risk job right now, but I'm just saying that even in the studio, yeah. you are going to have... Because you honestly, I mean, people go home and it's, it's not their fault. They mm -hmm. may pick a taxi to come to work. They've sat with somebody who has it. You don't know. So even you have to be careful. And I see you practice very good social distancing. You're all about eight, six to eight feet from each other. So we that's try. Good. We try. I think it was Richard Quest also that was confirmed as of yesterday. Yeah, apparently. that was yeah, Richard Quest. That's what okay. I was trying to say. Okay. Okay. Talking about social distancing. Now, we all can see how difficult it is to practice that in our markets and some of the most crowded areas as well. This morning, there was um, a market woman who said, Oh, Nasa virus near co into me here a face mask. Dr. Newman. Please speak to us because I, I was worried when I heard her say that. And we all suspected that it could be because the president lifted the lockdown and so indirectly is communicating that the virus is gone. Yeah, I, I, well, I think, I think that that is exactly the reason. Because, you know, when we started having some numbers, we said because of those numbers, we, we are locking down. Now, the president, you know, for whatever reasons, uh, says that we can now lift the lockdown. So those who don't understand what is going on, it may be a sign that things are clear now, things are fine now, so we can go back to our normal lives. You know, so I think all those measures, if not communicated properly, if the education doesn't go down properly, people may misinterpret the president's decisions as, uh, you know, a go ahead to do whatever they want to do. Because the while I was coming from, uh, through town, I realized everything is, is really back to normal. Mm. You will see only a few people with face masks, and, and I'm sure people are not even washing their hands, you know, again, because they feel that the risk has gone down because now we have more cases, but lockdown has been lifted. Yeah. So they feel that, okay, now everything is under control because they don't understand the president's actions and what, whatever has gone on. And we assume that everybody watches TV and listens to the radio. That, that is the problem. That, that is the assumption. We assume that everybody is watching uh, uh, TV, everybody is listening to the radio. And most, most of the people may not even listen to the president directly. They may, all, they may listen to commentaries from their friends and all the news going on. So I think that's where the problem is. Hmm. This, this is scary then. Dr. Betha, yeah. now another question that came in was the use of money, hard cash. Because uh, we know that any surface you touch could transmit it as well. This person wanted to understand. In this case where the lockdown has been lifted, I can go out, buy. A lot of people are back to using hard cash again. Now, in this case, what do I do? How do I sanitize the, the cash I have on me uh, in order not to hand it over to someone and probably infect the person? Well, um, I think it would be very difficult to do. Um, we're used to handling money all the time, so that would be difficult. But in my mind, that is just like taking a, just a small slice of the pie when it comes to contact and exposure. Um, and just to talk about the question you posed to Dr. Newman, yeah, I think that we have to look at um, changing us. The social distancing is a new behavior, and mm. there are two ways of people um, approaching how they change their behavior. Either you are extrinsically motivating them, or there's intrinsic motivation. Extrinsic means the lockdown. I'm forcing you to stay at home, and I put a soldier outside your door. So you have to keep the distance. Intrinsic means I understand why I need to keep a distance. And so I'm going to keep a distance. I don't need an external force to tell me to keep a distance. And so this is why our, our messaging has to go to a different level. We, this is where it, um, it's not just our local data. This is where we have to do a cultural adaptation. Dr. Newman was mentioning that not everybody listens to the radio um, TV or even takes a newspaper. 
This mm. is the time in the in Ghana, you see your body rule. You go to villages, Bobi about you know how in the past they used to go to villages with a with a, um, and, and go and tell Bobo villages, Bobo maybe yeah, the, yeah. the king that the, the chief wants all of you to gather at eight o'clock so people will hear it in their windows while they are sleeping. That hey, there's a town hall meeting with we need to go into the markets, the ministry of education, ministry of health, they need to find people. All those people who used to preach with their loud um, speakers and we don't know what they are saying, that we need to turn them into mess people who are telling the market women there's a disease in town in different languages. Like we have to change our strategy because clearly what you said, the woman said, mm -hmm. it means two things. The signal that was sent with the removing of the lockdown has, has, has had an unintended consequence and two, our message has not penetrated at all. You know, we talk about cell phone penetration. Our message penetration is very, very shallow. Mm. We have to change. It's like driving and changing gears from gear one to gear two. We have to shift gears completely. That clearly what we've done, it hasn't reached the masses. What have we have to re-strategize completely. Um, mm. They rule chiefs. And uh, we've talked about mobilizing the chiefs. Have we actually done it? Have the chiefs had some sort of phone conference to get to the smallest town? Within the next week, we have to target. Every small town chief needs to have a way of reaching their township. I mean, the messaging, if we are taking lockdown down, the messaging has to change and change it from extrinsic motivation of um, social distancing to an intrinsic motivation. Yeah. You know, and just to give an example, I call my mother and the messaging she's giving me, I mm. hear, say, Mama, what's your dear nasty part? I say, me tie, me tie mm. we, we want even an 80-year-old woman to be able to verbalize that, look, I have to keep my distance. Yeah. Then we are getting the message across. Mm. Hmm. Anyway, Dr. Newman, any last words before we wrap up on this segment? Uh, well, I, I would say that as a nation, uh, today I was quite, quite happy that uh, though people are still in town and all that, you realize that uh, the lockdown, now we know that people really stayed home. Because when they were home, we didn't know until they came back to town. So now I can see a big difference in terms of people uh, uh, listening to what the president says. You know, people were listening. Mm. So what it means is that whatever they say, people are likely to listen. Because yeah. now you see there's a big difference between last week and this week, when you go to town, mm -hmm. it means that generally we are we are law abiding in some sense. Yeah. You know, we may have practical challenges that prevent us from doing what we are supposed to do. So I, I was quite happy as a nation that we've moved on, you know, from from a certain kind of attitude. What it means is that if the president keeps doing what he's doing, right, keeps giving us direction, keep talking to us, maybe instead of coming once a week, he can decide to take one of the days of the week off. Mm. and come and not talk about that way forward, but to add some form of education to the public. Yeah. I'm sure people will listen to the president. Okay. If they know that every Wednesday, maybe in the evening, the president is coming from 7 to 8 to just to talk about coronavirus, not to way forward, but to educate us. I'm think, I think it's going to draw a lot of people's attention because we are listening to him. Mm. And I'm happy for what has happened so far, just that the education should continue because Definitely. we are listening to our president. Very valid point. Dr. Beth, a quick and one. I must say that, okay. I must say that the, the president and his administration have demonstrated on I mean, remarkable yeah. leadership. Yeah. I mean, I don't know of any country that has had six um, press conferences. The president yeah. is showing his face. He's paying for water, electricity, taking the message to the people. I mean, they've done above and beyond. And we have to give credit where well, credit is due, due and yeah. acknowledge the, the, the efforts and time yeah. he's put into this. And Absolutely. it is the same love and attention that may have made him decide, you know what, let me just leave the lockdown and for allow the people. people. I don't, but I'm just saying that um, kudos to the administration for the, the work they okay. put into um, COVID-19. All right, Dr. Bertha, this is just a 30-second question. Quick one. So we came across a photo where people were washing the N95 masks drying them and selling them again are they reusable yes um it's not washing but um a lot of hospitals are recycling them up to four times 
some are using UV lights. Um, I haven't read the details of everything, but okay. um, the world has N95 masks. We used to use about 15 a day for one patient per person. So if six people go and see the patient that day, that's 90 masks on one. And today we are reusing them. And it's not just N95. In some hospitals, the nurses surgical. are changing okay. using the same PPE. I mean, so yes. N95s are recyclable for up to four times. And, and even the surgical mask as well. But what if this is someone who's just washing on the street and selling back to us on the that, road? That, that, that's illegal and immoral. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, doctors, for speaking to us. Dr. Bertha Sewa, IE, yes. infect, uh, infectious disease specialist, and Dr. Newman Arthur is a clinical psychologist.